Um, just a wee bit of housekeeping about the mobile phones, um, just to have them on silent, because they interfere with the hazard. Um, members, I haven't received any apologies, if members are aware of any apologies. Um, and um, I'd like to take this um, opportunity to welcome our newest member um, to the committee, Claire Hanna. Claire, you're very welcome. Um, I look forward, and indeed, I'm sure on behalf of all the committee members, we look forward to working with you over the weeks and months ahead. And um, just for the record, it's great to have another female on board. Um, <laughs> Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity um, to thank Claire's predecessor, uh, Mr. Sean Rogers, for his valued contribution to the committee uh, during um, his time here. So thanks to Sean um, for that. Uh, members, uh, agenda item two, minutes of the last meeting of the 1st of July. Um, they can be found at page five of your electronic packs. Um, if you're content with the minutes of the, mem the meeting of the 1st of July, um, I'll sign them into the record. Yeah, I so propose. Okay. Members, agenda item three. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome Kieran and your team today. Um, you are also welcome back after the recess, Kieran. Um, Members, agenda item three, we have a correspondence from the Carnegie Trust, and if members can recall, this um, correspondence for, uh, is in relation to a briefing on their report uh, towards a wellbeing framework. Uh, a copy of this correspondence can be found at page nine of your electronic packs. At the committee meeting on the 1st of July, uh, we agreed to defer a decision uh, or whether or not to accept this offer of the um, Carnegie Trust to come to the, the committee to brief us on it. Um, so, members, I would, I'm asking, I suppose, um, can we now consider whether or not we want to receive a briefing from them on this report? And, and, and just to say, I think maybe uh, our next piece of correspondence is from the Committee of Finance and Personnel, and it's in relation to sickness absence in the uh, public sector. But just to kind of correlate the two, um, this, this, the Carnegie Trust, I'm a member of the DFP committee, and they did do a briefing to the DFP committee around the uh, wellbeing framework. It's a very good piece of, uh, a very good report, and a very useful tool to have. Um, at, at, at that um, meeting, uh, there was some reference uh, made to the PAC. Um, uh, I suppose and, uh, uh, the reference was made, basically, you know, about implementing the, the wellbeing framework right across the departments, and um, I suppose our role that we would play in making recommendations around, I suppose, procurement and, and, and all of that. Um, so there was. At that time, I felt that it would be good to have the Carnegie Trust here to give us a small briefing on that report. So I just <coughs> want to throw it open to members to see what they think and what. I it's so propose. Okay, uh, Roy. I think it sounds very interesting, but I'm sort of conscious: is it overlapping the work of another committee? You know, um, um, we have more of a, an auditing historical role. Um, is, the is, it, is it more of a live information? I, I'm just thinking if, if the Finance Committee, Finance and Personnel Committee, this is right up their street, looking at staff and attendance, and uh, should two be committees be looking at the same thing? Yeah, well, um, yeah absolutely. Um, but it was more around the Audit Office report on to the sickness levels within uh, the public sector. And I suppose what recommendations that was made coming out of that? I don't care. Do you want uh, to? I would just say. Um, Probably Carnegie Trust, they have a wider uh, sort of agenda here. We, we have spoken to them ourselves in, in the audit office, and I just have in front of me their framework report. So, the sort of things that we're saying is um, so they have an interest in you know, scrutiny, and uh, one of the points was the current focus on scrutiny fails to focus on outcomes. So, they're, they're very much into the should be more okay. focus on outcomes rather than outputs or activity indicators, and that's a conversation we're very interested in as well. Um, they'd recommended new processes to assist the process of open positive scrutiny, and the executive uh, they recommended should lay an annual report in front of the Assembly for debate on progress made by Programme for Government towards outcomes. Um, 
There's been a lot of good work, I think, done in Scotland in this area, so there is, I think there is potential for, for read across here. So, um, I think, yeah, because the authors of this report did mention the work of the PAC at times, you know, when our recommendations may hinder sometimes the, 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 the forward working of the implementation. Of a strong the uh, argument has been made. I'd be uh, happy to sign the proposal. Okay. So, agree, agreed, and the mm -hmm. clerks will get a date set for that. Thank you. Um, members, we also have correspondence um, from the Committee of Finance and Personnel, as I alluded to earlier, um, in, review, in terms of a report of the review of sickness absence here uh, in the public sector. The Committee has now received a copy of the formal response from the Minister of Finance and Personnel um, to the recommendation contained in the report, uh, and the responses is in your um, packs at page 11. Members, if you yeah. want to have a look at that. Um, the Minister advises that the sickness absence levels in the public sector is receiving constant attention and uh, she also outlined a number of positive measures aimed at reducing uh, sickness absence levels and they include the extension of the WELL programme, uh, welfare support services and the launch of staff, enga uh, staff engagement charter. Um, dedicated training courses for managers and available, the availability of flexible working patterns. Um, uh, again, Kieran, do you want to make any comment? This is only to note members, but Kieran, do you want to? Uh, just maybe to brief members, just on the background to this, uh, our office did uh, a cross sector report on sickness absence a couple of years ago. Looked not just at the civil service, but education and the health service. Uh, this committee didn't take the report, but it was referred to the uh, DFP, the Finance Committee, and then the DFP <coughs> Committee produced their report. Uh, sickness absence, I think, has been a perennial issue, you know, that we haven't really totally cracked here. There's been some progress made. Uh, there's been, there was a downward trend up to 2012, but it's sort of, it's levelled out. Um, so there's a lot of potential to get further improvement in this area. Uh, there seems to be quite a good level of engagement with the Minister on this, so, um, but it's something that we will continue to, to track. Okay. Um, Chairperson, over a long period of time, there's been a lot of work done by the Audit Office and, um, indeed, uh -huh. by the Public Accounts Committee, and I think a lot has achieved, but time keeps changing and uh, new issues come to, to mind. My own opinion is that uh, the absence programmes in many departments has changed, improved beyond recognition, but there are still very serious gaps. And I'm thinking in particular of the uh, prison service, where I know in recent times I've had a lot of dealings, and their support service is far from adequate. In fact, it some people might describe it as appalling. So we certainly will keep a continuing interest in this, bearing in mind that there are, in fact, departments that have made the progress and others that have not. Any other members? Thank you, uh, Kieran, uh, for that. Uh, members, um, moving on, we have also correspondence from the Department of Health and Social Services. Um, in, in relation to the Fire and Rescue Services Board appointment, and it's on page 19. Um, uh, it's, the correspondence is the response to the committee's letter of the 9th of July, in which it highlighted the concerns raised by the Commissioner of Public Appointments um, over the appointment of a member of the Fire and Rescue Services Board. Um, they indicated that with regards to the appointment of a new Fire and Rescue Service Board member in November 2014, <coughs> there had been a breach of the Code of Practice for public appointments um, here, um, and the Accounting Officer for DHSSPS um, has responded to reject this allegation, stating that the appointment process was in compliance with guidance in place at that time the appointment was made back in November 2014. Uh, he points out that the revised guidance was introduced in May 2015 and assures the committee that the department will continue to apply the updated guidance in the future. Um, members, it is, can I suggest before I let you in, John, that we write back to the DHSSPS 
copying in the Commissioner's uh, response, informing them that we note their correspondence and will be monitoring closely their compliance. John, do you uh, want to? Chairperson, I would agree entirely. But that's now history, given that that individual has now resigned. And I suspect, although it was given as personal reason, that the resignation was related to the query. And I think the, uh, the committee was absolutely right, particularly in the case of the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service, which had a history of uh, bad senior management. I think it's an achievement that at last they're recognising that there are um, guidelines set down by the Commissioner that need to be followed. I believe they're splitting hairs about the dates when it came into being, because the Commissioner's uh, 28 recommendations were published in January 2014, which was before this. Uh, but uh, I understand that the uh, interim chief executive has now moved on, resigned. There's some other person in charge, but it has been a long and torturous journey with, I think, four independent inquiries going on at one time. But I think it's been worthwhile. And it's my view, and I hope it's everybody else's, that we have a, a senior management and fire service that reflects the heroic and wonderful work of the ordinary fire uh, fighters, male and female, who bore the brunt of a lot of the adverse publicity that surrounded them. So I would try and be positive about it, and I agree with you. Note the correspondence from them, and let's hope from now on that the proper procedures will be followed. It won't be boys for the job, jobs for the boys, and it won't be people slipping in and out of positions. Uh, being a fire officer one day and then turning up on the board of management the next day with not a single question asked at the interview about their past record. I mean, that was appalling. So I'll leave it at that. John, Deputy Chair, President, thank you. Um, members, no other. Um, members, I'll take you back to page 17. Um, I slipped this. I forgot about this one just before we moved on to correspondence on page 19. It's, I cor <laughs> it's correspondence. It's on page 17 um, from a member of the public making a number of allegations about politicians and <laughs> officials in the Republic of Ireland. Members, um, you'll note that this is obviously outside the remit of this committee. Therefore, it would be my intention to um, ask members to note the correspondence, or if any member wants to. Yeah. It's clear um, the person has issues, uh, and as, as you say yourself, it's outside our jurisdiction, although he is trying to get us to claim. Uh, the remainder of the island. Um, <laughs> maybe we should write back and say we've enough bother with the wee six that we have, and <laughs> when we get round to it, we'll have to look at it again. Um, but no, I, I think really we should just note it and, and pass yeah. it on. He does believe there is a glimmer of hope where the last democratic institute. <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> the happy pals are clearly working. <laughs> okay, members, as I say, it's outside of our arena, so it's, it's just for members to note. Okay, members, moving on to page 21, um, we have correspondence from DFP in relation to guidance. Um, members, um, this correspondence is from the Treasury Officer of Accounts, um, and it was issued by the TOA to all accounting officers to outline revised guidelines for dealing with the media inquiries uh, regarding the Audit Office and Public Accounts Reports. Um, uh, members, this has not been formally sent to the PAC. We did not receive this letter. Um, it came via um, the Audit Office. The revised guidance encourages counting officers to robustly challenge the committee where they consider that the committee um, press releases or statements are unjustified or overstated. Uh, this is in contrast to the previous guidance, which was instructed, um, which had instructed accounting officers to remain silent until the assembly process was complete, and then to make their response through the means of memoranda of reply. Uh, 
The, the staff have just uh, distributed a copy of a letter that we received today just from the TOA in which he apologises for the oversight of not copying PAC into the guidance uh, when it was issued. Um, Members, do you have any comment to make? Yes. Uh, yes. Accept their apology for the oversight mm -hmm. and tell them we have noted it, noted the correspondence. Try and put the hunting online. <coughs> Roy? Uh, I'm, I'm interested in your approach, and it may necessitate bringing permanent secretaries more frequently back to this committee. It's Here. just another effort to try and um, make the Public Accounts Committee. And can I say on behalf of every member of this committee, whatever party they are, nobody ever overstepped the limit in terms of trying to do their job. And I think they deserve tremendous praise for very often stepping outside political interests to do that. And I'm really getting cheesed off with a silly uh, campaign by the Department of Finance and Personnel to gag Public Accounts Committee. I have every confidence it will work, and all members will remain above that type of intimidation. Absolutely. I take particular exception to their paragraph 4. Um, here, have you any comments you want to make? Uh, I think the main comment I would make was that uh, this was news to us as well. Um, DFP have a good track record when they develop guidance that they talk to us and they consult with us. Uh, this one uh, we knew nothing about. Uh, and in fact, there, there's a couple of sentences in it that I, I would take exception to. You know, it says uh, part eight on, so it refers to our reports as well as BAC reports. So it says ministers have the right to respond publicly to criticisms of policy as robustly as seems appropriate. Well, I don't criticise policy. Uh, it's specific in my office's legislation that I don't question the merits of policy objectives, so the sentence is absolutely irrelevant. Uh, but nobody talked to me about this piece of guidance. Okay. So, you so, uh, and, uh, <coughs> so it's bad form. Yeah. Bad form, very bad form. Uh -huh. Roy? Yeah. Uh, again, I, I find this uh, highly unusual, and I, <coughs> you, Madam Chair, I, I take it. Um, that the Comptroller and Auditor General would find this uh, out of sequence with the guidance given to other public accounts committee, either at Westminster or mm -hmm. devolved regions. And it seems that um, some ministers seem to be becoming overly sensitive to the constructive criticism that we may make on occasions. Chairperson, I'm not even sure as ministers. I'm inclined to believe that as. Uh, the pressures coming from within the senior echelons of the civil service, we would dearly, believe, we would dearly love to see the independence of the audit office cease, be brought back under finance and personnel where they could control it, and at the same time gag the public accounts committee, which, as Roy points out, is operating under exactly the same rules and guidelines as. Um, had been, had as, been. Uh, yes, as Wales, Scotland, and the Republic of Ireland, and I suspect any other reputable uh, democracy anywhere in the world. Absolutely, I do. As I said, I do take exception to some of the language that is no, no. used in this correspondence. Um, certainly, uh, uh, I mean, I or other members of this committee have never been sensationalist. No. Whenever we're reporting in the media, mm. we've never been unbalanced, or we've never had said anything that wasn't evidence-based. Um, members, we have two options as how to respond uh, to this. Um, we could write back to the TOA asking for clarification on a sentiment. Specifically on paragraph 4, where he refers to public comment in the media as part of the audit process, which is sensationalist in nature and, as I just said, <coughs> unbalanced and not evidence based. And I can only, only hope he was not referring to any member of this committee. Um, um, and I can assure the TOA that any public comment made by PAC members in the past in relation to to our report is not sensationalist and is always evidence-based. Um, our second option is to request that the TOA come before the committee to explain the points um, he is trying to get across in more detail, given the opportunity um, to speak to us 
squirrely. Well, I think it would be a, a more uh, well, interesting uh, approach, well, and uh, it would be interesting to see what answers we would get. That's so one I would favour. Chairperson, you will recall that both you and I, as Vice Chair, had met these people on at least two occasions. And there was clear understanding, I believe, that we reflected accurately the views of every other member of the committee. And to begin now opening up more dialogue on this, I think, in a way, is, well, there's a danger that we start to undermine our own independence by starting to discuss or negotiate with them. We've got to protect our independence, and there are dangers in doing that if we start to engage with them or even encourage them. And, uh, you know, my original suggestion, although I'm open to accepting this, was to simply note it. Mm -hmm. Members, um, just for clarification, on, on his response, he does um, confirm his attendance at our evidence session yes. on Wednesday the 16th, but would be unavailable for subsequent meetings with us because he is retiring um, on the 30th of September. I will wish him a long and happy retirement. <laughs> Members, so... Will is, we... is it worth his while even coming on the 16th? Then? Is there somebody else coming there after? He's, he's named somebody else. I mean, somebody's coming in October, Mike Brennan. Mike Brennan, yeah. Could, could we not raise it with him on that date on the 16th? Let them know now in advance that we're going to raise that particular yeah. issue. Fair enough. Yeah, we can I mean, I think, I think there's no point in hanging somebody else for it. No. No. Yeah. Wouldn't shoot the messenger. Yeah, so we can write to him and tell him we'll raise it. Can you go on the second before his retirement? <laughs> Watch him well. Okay, members. Um, agenda item four, which is matters arising. Um, it's on page 27, members of your electronics packs, and it's correspondence from the audit office in relation to um, the fire. Uh, Service pension raised by Mrs. Hagoka. Sorry, my apologies. Hashkova. Um, the audit office outlined that the complaint from Ms. Hashkova related to the calculation of the value of the transfer out of a pension scheme for uh, a matrimonial case. Uh, these values have been calculated by a third party service uh, provider, Capita. Up until 2010, uh, the Fire and Rescue Services subsequently found that Capita had been using incorrect factors in their calculations for this. Uh, so Capita had sought to reach compensation arrangements with individual employees. Uh, but in the case raised by Ms. Hackett-Voka, the individual firefighter concerned um, has rejected the compensation officer offer, so it is likely that this will result in a court case members. Um, so that's a, it's really an outstanding um, HR case between the firefighter and the fire service, um, and the audit office has said that they will continue to monitor the case. Uh, Ross, you wanted to make yeah. a comment on? Um, I, I understand that there's been a couple of issues in relation to not just the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service, but the Fire service fire throughout service the, the UK, uh, and again in relation to capita, I believe, and there have been miscalculations for quite a few. Um, do we have any idea if there are many other cases, maybe still on the pipeline, um, people who are in retirement, who are in receipt of pensions, has been miscalculated? And will that then be an additional cost yeah. mm -hmm. on the pension scheme? Um, in, the, in, the, in the case of Northern Ireland, Chair, uh, there are relatively few cases. Uh, in fact, most of those cases have been settled directly between Capita and the firefighters concerned. So it is quite an isolated incident. And uh, uh, the compensation payments coming from that would be coming from Capita yep. and not the, the pension scheme. Okay. Well, what, what about the contribution to Capita for running the scheme? Well, Capita no longer are providing those services for the Fire and Rescue Service. No, no but they would have been receiving remuneration for running the service? I would imagine so, yes. So surely there's something in terms of if they have been paid to provide a service and the service has been less than appropriate, then there should have been some sort of reduction, reduction in terms of what they have been paid from the public purse as well. 
Oh, uh, we're, we're not cited. No, not, not, but, no. Um, of course, maybe have We can follow that up. Follow that up. Yeah. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks, you. Uh, members, agenda item five, which is our forward work programme, which is at page 32 of your packs. Um, the for forward work programme is from the period September through to December of this year. Um, members, you'll see that it's a busy, busy schedule ahead with four inquiries planned for between now and Christmas. Um, and Lucia is going to uh, make a few brief comments in relation to the for forward work programme. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes. Um, it is going to be a busy schedule. There's just a few things I wanted to, to make you aware of. Um, the, we have evidence session next week on the on the health, general health report, um, and then the next inquiry is the Northern Ireland Events Company, um, which will have to be staggered over two sessions um, because. Um, uh, Accounting officers from DECAL and DETI are required, and it wasn't possible to schedule them both in on the on the one day. Um, so the first evidence session is the 7th of October, and that would be uh, the DECAL accounting officer also written out um, the Cale Commission to uh, invite um, Mervyn Elder, who is the who was the former um, chair of the Northern Ireland Events Company. So I haven't yet got a reply from Mr Elder, but um, it would be that he would be invited to come on the 7th of October. Um, and then the next evidence session is on the 21st of October, and that's with um, Detty Accounting Officer. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to attend on the 14th, so that's why there's a... You know, there's a gap of the two weeks. Um, then moving on to after Halloween, um, we'll be doing our next inquiry into sustainability of schools in November. Um, and then just before Christmas, uh, the fourth one, which is land disposals in the housing executive on the 9th of December. Um, and I'd just like to point out we have scheduled a meeting in for the 16th of December, um, but um, I've been reliably informed uh, that that's actually recess. So um, I'll need to reschedule that for January. Oh dear. Okay, members, that's the main point I wanted to make. No sure. bother. Thank you. Any comments? Chairperson. Uh, the, uh, the events company, uh, because there's two accounting officers, means two sessions. But I just the only question I ask is the uh, the issues related to the events company. Of course, are extremely serious. But the events company doesn't exist any longer. It's mm -hmm. gone. It's part of history. Uh, are we justified in allocating two days? Um. I just come in there. Uh, there's a number of different parties involved in this, uh, Deputy Chair. Um, the first one is was um, this was in Decal's patch, so you have the current accounting officer, okay. Decal. Uh, you will also have Paul Sweeney, who was the accounting officer at the time. He happens to be in education at the minute, okay. so he will have particular insight. Okay. Um, that's fair enough. Uh, the the company is still on the books in a sense, even though it's not doing anything. Uh, so it is important. I think you have a first-hand sort of experience from uh, those who were there at the time. Hence, uh, calling the chair. Uh, Daddy's interest a couple of weeks later is totally different because uh, De um, if you have questions on the you know the, the forensic investigation and how long it took. Decal can't answer those because that was conducted by Detty. So uh, there's a separate, this discrete set of questions there for the Detty accounting officer. Um, as regards, I wouldn't see the second one as a, you know, a full, you know, full session. You probably can dispose of that fairly quickly. But uh, you need Detty there to cover that particular ground, which is completely separate from the issues that DECAL can answer on. Just finally, uh -huh. do, do we have any plans to call the 
uh, former chief executive as a witness? Uh, no, and um, if you're in closed session, I think I could. Um, yeah. We're in open session. Yeah, we we're, can, are we in? Members, we're in open session. We can. I can agree to go into closed session. Members want to take five minutes and agree to go into closed session. There's sensitive information which might be yeah. put in before we go into uh -huh. yeah. okay. closed session. Okay, members of the public gallery, um, we're going into. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Uh, member. As I said, page 35 of your PACs is the inquiry into managing and protecting funds held in courts. Memorandum of reply um, is largely positive. Um, there have been, out of a total of six recommendations, one has already been implemented, one is the process of being implemented, two are accepted and two are partially accepted. Um, you will see at recommendation five members the um, Court Service have agreed to undertake a review of the current mechanism uh, by which the Court Funds Office recovers its costs from clients. They have confirmed that proposals have been developed for a more transparent, easily understood and equitable arrangement for deduction of costs. Uh, the Court Service are aiming to introduce this new model by April 2016. And this model should address the Attorney General's concerns over the legality of the current system for deduction of fees for investment advice. Um, I would therefore suggest that we, this committee, could liaise with the Attorney General's office after the new model has been introduced in 2016 <coughs> to check whether or not his concerns have been fully uh, addressed. At this stage, we can again consider whether a briefing from the Attorney General is required, um, and if that's what members so wish, um, we could write to the Attorney General to advise him of this action, if members agreed upon agreed, that. Sure. Agreed? Yeah. Okay. Um, Kieran, you have no comment to make? You're no happy further comment. Okay. Sure. Thank uh, you. Members, moving on to Agenda Item 7, which is the inquiry into the PSNI use of agency staff. Chair. Which is an update. Am I to clear an interest? Um, <laughs> yeah. Obviously, I'm a member of the Policing Board, but I'm also chair of the Audit and Risk Management Committee of the Policing Board, and this will obviously be coming back to me again. And in the circumstances, I, I think I should withdraw because of that. Uh, okay. okay. Okay, Mr. Hussey, you can. You're free to go. Thank you, Miss. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ross, you're, 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 not, you're not coming back. You have to go on. Yeah, okay. Okay, members, um, as you can see at page 48 um, of your packs, you will find an update on the status of the implementation of the recommendations contained within the committee's report on the use of agency staff within the PSNI. Um, I have to say the update is extremely positive, uh, with confirmation that all but one of the ten recommendations uh, have been implemented. The one recommendation which has not been implement, re, implemented relates to the uh, Office of the Police Ombudsman um, to extend its remit to cover uh, civilian, including temporary staff within the police service. So there's been a proposal from the Department of Justice Minister to introduce this uh, reform, which was not approved by the executive. <coughs> when they considered it back in October 2014. Uh, the Minister has now indicated that he intends to defer this matter until early in the next Assembly mandate. Okay. So, Members, um, are you happy to note this, or have Members any questions? Happy to note? Yep. Aaron, are you uh, I have positive, no positive feedback? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay, members, moving on to agenda item six, which is our inquiry into the general report on health and social care sector 2012 to 2013 and 2013 to 2014. Um, we're going to get an introduction to the briefing. Um, members, at the page 53 of your electronic packs, you'll find a copy of the audit office report into the health and social care sector. And that's at page 53. 
Uh, at page 145, 145, you will also see a briefing paper from the Audit Office um, report and to the, this inquiry. And in your confidential packs, your yellow packs, you will find updated figures for 2014-15, uh, which has been provided by uh, the Audit Office. Um, so, Kieran, um, do you want to enter? Just the, the uh, well, Chair, you were right. Uh, we did do a, a briefing back in, I think it was May, June, May yep. uh, and then um, the session was deferred. Um, I suppose what has happened since then, another financial year is worked through. So the, the report actually says 12, 13, 13, 14. So we're getting a bit dated. So we thought it would be sensible to. Uh, provide you with a, an update of uh, the key figures in the report. Um, and so there's a separate memo on that. So Chair, um, I am in a rather difficult situation here because some of this covers a period where I was in control uh, as Minister and I'm just wondering should I be remaining here? I'll take advice from the clerk. Um, so it's entirely up to you, Jim. Um, but is it allowed? Uh, I don't want to keep declaring the rate we're going, there'll be nobody here. Uh, but uh, it's particularly wise for me to be in here. Yeah, I suppose just, and in, in, in this is just advise me that given that you were involved and it was your ministerial remit at the uh -huh. time, then maybe you should uh, okay, remove yourself, Jim. Stay outside. Okay, we'll have a cup of tea. Then there were four. <laughs> Um, members, and just for information, uh, Cairns given uh, an introduction brief, and then we'll go into closed session. That's Cairn. Uh, no, all I really wanted to say uh, it was just common sense that you would have the most up-to-date figures. Uh, where we have up-to-date figures, they're all from published information. So it's from the uh, the, aud the accounts for 14-15. We have audited them all, so the figures are either from the accounts or other other material on targets and compliance with targets that the department has put into the the public domain. Uh, so uh, it just makes sense uh, to have that. Uh, I suppose um, I suppose the key thing in those fresh figures is uh, there's been quite a drop in performance against the operational targets, particularly waiting list targets, uh, during the last year, and that's something um, I suppose you, you will want to, to focus on. Um, I think that's all I want to say just yeah. at this stage, and then we'll pass over to Sean for the closed okay. session. Okay. Okay. Um, mm. So we'll move, Sean, are you okay if we move into close now for this section, or is there anything you want to... No close, yeah. Close, yeah. yeah. Okay, members, can I seek an agreement to move into closed session? Okay. Assembly, committee room 29.